So, good evening, everybody. Thank you all very much for coming along tonight to the Royal Society at the UK's National Academy of Science. My name is Dr. Lewis Dartnell. I'm a UK research agency uh, research fellow at the University of Leicester, uh, working in the field of astrobiology and, and the possibility of life beyond the Earth. Uh, and I'm also a science writer as well. And before I introduce the panel that we have along for us tonight, there are one or two uh, points of order and, and items of, of housekeeping. And apologies if you've come along to the Raw Society a lot and, and have to listen to this uh, very often. Uh, but first and foremost, uh, please could every single one of you reach into your pocket and check that your phone is off, uh, silenced or, or put into airplane mode, um, as we have all just checked ourselves on stage. Um, now, there's no planned fire excavation, uh, sorry, evacuations uh, for tonight. So if the alarm does start going off, um, please evacuate through the fire exits, which are up here at the front uh, on, on our right, your left, and also in the middle of the room, um, which is the ways that you entered into this, into this room here. Uh, and lastly, I need to inform you that this evening's event is being webcast live uh, across the internet for, for people to watch streaming through the website um, where this event was, was advertised and will be recorded for posterity um, on, the, uh, on the archive of the Society on, on the website. Uh, so crashing on to the fun stuff, uh, welcome and, and, uh, and hello. Um, thank you for coming along to the Extremes in Science event. And what we'll be talking about tonight uh, is a very mixed board, a small gas board of different fields of science represented by our Royal Society Research Fellows here. Uh, everything from volcanic eruptions and deep oceans to polar ice caps and the atmospheres of alien planets. And we're going to be exploring and looking at how scientists are studying these most extreme phenomena and, and processes, uh, if not even exposing themselves and working in very extreme environments themselves. So adventurous scientists, superhero scientists, if you like. Um, and by doing all this, pushing back the very boundaries of what we understand in, in, their, con in their conduct of the science. And so, to talk us through that tonight, um, we have our panel of, of people on the stage, and I'm going to allow themselves to introduce uh, themselves. Um, so starting off with Hugh. Hello, my name is Hugh Tuffin from the University of Lancaster, and I'm a volcanologist. I do lots of work on active volcanoes around the planet, and my objective is to try to help people who need to evacuate in the case of hazardous activity. So I'm going to be talking about some of the research that I do as a Royal Society Fellow, looking at the processes that control volcanic eruptions. Judith? I'm Judith Hillier. I'm an Education Research Fellow at the University of Oxford. And my research particularly looks at the processes of learning to explain and teach physics in the classroom and why and how people become physics teachers. Patricia? Um, hi, my name is Patricia Sanchez Baracaldo. I'm an evolutionary biologist. Um, I work on cyanobacteria um, and I'm trying to understand how photosynthesis and oxygenic photosynthesis made our planet habitable. Uh, I'm a Dorothy Hodgkin Research Fellow and I work at Bristol University. Hello, my name is Lee Fletcher. I'm an atmospheric physicist working in the Department of Physics over at Oxford. But I study physics of planetary atmospheres in general, so mostly specialising in Jupiter-style planets, places like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, and the various diverse satellites that we found ar around those ones. Uh, the idea of my research is to try and place the atmosphere of our own planet, with its fragile climate and uh, fragile environment, into a much broader context and try to uh, understand what gave rise to, uh, to life and hopefully intelligent life here on planet Earth. Marvellous. Um, so thank you. Please do join me in welcoming our four panellists along tonight. <laughs> now the format for tonight, we're going to hear from each of our panellists for five, maybe six minutes um, with some projected, projected images. Uh, telling us a little bit about their science uh, and the extremes of the science they do and how they go about doing it. And, and we'll do it in the same order as we introduced ourselves. So Hugh is, is first up. This is why it's important we're sat in this one, otherwise things would have gone all awry. Right, 
Thank you. So if you were asked to name a very violent and extreme event taking place on the Earth's surface, I guess many of you would think of a, of a volcanic eruption. Think of a huge plume of ash rising up and darkening the skies, potentially circumnavigating the whole globe and disrupting life for many, many people. You might think about lava flows that could engulf everything in their path and destroy <coughs> whole towns. Um, absolutely, volcanoes are some of the most potentially deadly and extreme events that we do have on Earth. And a very, very large magnitude eruption could potentially be quite catastrophic for life as we know it. So I'm just going to be talking about some of the research that is going on looking at volcanic eruptions and some of the work that, that, that I'm personally doing in this field. Um, I do quite a lot of work um, so, uh, doing outreach work and people say to me, uh, Hugh, could you please put on some kind of uh, spacesuit because this is what volcanologists do. We subject ourselves to great peril in, in order to try to carry out this important science. Um, and I should really say that there is extreme danger with volcanoes, but it's not volcanologists who are subjected to extreme danger. We have backup. We have a, a helicopter right next to, um, to the crater edge, or, you know, or we, we're very carefully monitoring what's happening at that volcano. There are tens of millions of people, especially in Indonesia and the Philippines, but in many other countries who are in extreme and real danger. They don't have that backup and they live very close to volcanoes that could potentially explode. That's tens of millions of people. And that gives us a very, very pressing motivation to want to understand what happens in a volcano before it erupts so that we can recognise the warning signs of an impending eruption and so that we can do our utmost to get everybody out who could be potentially affected by it. Uh, my own personal experience, I've, been, I, I've witnessed lots of eruptions, but for me one of the most extreme ones uh, was going to Balderbunka in Iceland uh, last year. This was a huge outpouring of lava that took place and it lasted for many months. And I was just shocked by the sheer scale of this river of lava that was coming out. The quantity of heat that was being generated, uh, the flux of heat coming out, was similar to a nuclear bomb going off every few seconds. Just to think about the quantity of energy that was coming out in this. And our plan was to try to sample the lava as it was coming out and to get some information on how the lava was moving so that we can help uh, build new models of how lava uh, moves. So um, one of the things that we had to do was to get close to the lava in order to uh, uh, sample it. Hello. Pardon me. Let's try to play this for you. OK, so this was the edge of the lava uh, flow at Balvabunga. You'll notice that there's no spacesuit there. There's actually Wellington boots <laughs> and some kind of apron that looks rather like a chef's apron. And there was very rapid cooking. So the uh, uh, saucepan of water here was boiled in one second, pretty much. So that was some extreme heat. But the good thing for us here is that we were able to collect a small sample that we can then take into the much more controlled conditions of a lab. So we then got a tiny piece of this lava that we can put into an extreme microscope. This is a, a microscope that has a um, tiny furnace that can go up to 1500 degrees C. We put our little fragment of lava into this and then we can look and see what happens to the lava as, for example, it's cooling down. So this is a view of a, this is a tiny view of what's happening on a micro scale. You can see the scale here, that's one millimeter, a micro scale of what happens inside this lava as it's cooling down. We're growing this actually quite beautiful uh, rash of crystals that are forming. And this crystallization process means that the lava is changing from being a liquid, from being a fluid that is uh, rapidly uh, ad advancing to a solid. It's the formation of that crust on lava flows that is then holding them back and can be limiting the, um, the extent to which they can flow forwards. So we're taking some quite extreme conditions, but it's controlled inside a tiny furnace, which lets us then build uh, models based on this crystallization process, based on the rate of crystal growth. We can then extrapolate this um, to looking at the advance of larger 
lavas. Um, volcanoes don't only produce magma, they also give off huge fluxes of gases. And a famous example of, um, of volcanic gas emissions, volcanic aerosols impacting climate was that of Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991. Uh, this was a large eruption, one of the largest of the last century, and created about 0.5 degrees C of uh, global cooling, as you can see at the top there, for a, a, a couple of years. However, if we scale this up to the not so distant past and go to Toba in Sumatra, only 73,000 years ago, there was an, an eruption that was 300 times bigger than Pinatubo. <coughs> we don't know what the climatic effects were exactly, but they, we know that they were drastic. And current models are suggesting that there was global cooling. If you look at the um, bottom graph here, there's the wiggly line there. That is showing the rough uh, cooling globally. You're looking at potentially 20 degrees C global cooling for several years. <coughs> which is really quite frightening and interesting to consider what would happen if that, if that took place today. On a more optimistic note, I should just end by saying that volcanoes are potentially great sources of energy. So um, I guess you're familiar with geothermal energy, the idea of drilling downwards to hot rock and extracting <laughs> heat from there. But there's a great initiative taking place in Iceland the idea is to, is to drill hotter than ever before to try to actually tap rock right next to, to magma. The plan there is that, is that uh, far more energy could be extracted by uh, going to much higher temperatures. Whilst the Icelanders were drilling about five years ago, they wanted to go to four kilometres depth and drill down. They got to two kilometres and the, the drill bit got stuck. They tried to pull it out, it got stuck, they re-drilled and what came out of it is the material I've got here. It was actually ash and pumice. They had accidentally hit magma inside a volcano at only two kilometers depth, which was quite frightening because we had lots of, of geophysical monitoring of this volcano. We had no idea that there was magma so shallow right under a car park. <laughs> but the really good thing really good thing is that there was not any huge explosion, which means that one could potentially try to extract heat right from the interface of the edge of magma inside a volcano. And this could be an order of magnitude more powerful than current geothermal energy. So I will stop there. Thank you. Um, so Judith, if you want to take a podium, um, and tell us about your work. <coughs> so science occupies in school curriculums around the world and across a number of countries science teachers grapple with the challenges of making these fundamental scientific ideas engaging and accessible to their students. And just as Hugh and Lee and Patricia and Hewis want, Lewis want you to go, wow, that is really amazing, that is absolutely fascinating, they also want you to go away with some understanding of the exciting research with which they're engaged. So science teachers in our schools want their students to go, wow, that is awesome, that is absolutely amazing, and to develop some understanding of the concepts under discussion. And science teachers frequently draw on recent events, discussions, news, which have become into the public domain in order to make their lessons come alive and to help students see the relevance of what they are studying. And extreme science is fantastic for this, showing students how scientists are grappling with some of the most interesting and complex ideas at the frontiers of our knowledge help students to see how science moves forward. It's not all done by dead white men. And how ideas are developed, how new data can challenge current scientific thinking. But extreme science also helps students to see how these new ideas are standing on the so shoulders of giants. The incredible Philae landing on Comet 67P last year was possible because scientists were using those ideas that Newton and Kepler had come up with so many centuries before, how they've developed over time. And that is important, it's fascinating. And the question is, is what can scientists do to support teachers in this? Should they do anything at all? Now, scientists 
um, will pretty much talk to anybody who will listen about their work. I should know, I'm married to one, and he used to read his papers on superconductivity to our two-month-old son, who went off to sleep beautifully. <laughs> But the key is to make that extreme science accessible and usable, and preferably usable to teachers in the classroom on a day-to-day -day basis. It is fantastic when scientists can come into schools and talk, but that's not possible every nine o'clock Monday morning classroom. So one thing that scientists at my own institution have done is through something we have called Oxford Sparks, which is a portal they have developed, and the web address is there, for engaging with a wealth of exciting science which takes place across the University of Oxford. And it has a whole series of videos and blogs and teaching resources and it is aimed at everybody, whether you're a school student, a parent, a teacher, whether you're interested in a member of the public or a scientist, there is something there. There's games, there's apps, there's a whole bunch of stuff. And what I'm going to show you, and I have an awful feeling I need to come out of this to go to a YouTube video. Ooh, is it there? <laughs> I'm not sure it is. Haha, <laughs> fantastic, it's coming. So, <coughs> so we've got a number of these, and this is a little guy, green guy called Ossie. And he goes through a series of adventures. And I'll let you watch the video. See if you could spot who's narrating it. Welcome to the birth of a volcano tour. I'm happy that I'm proud to be your onboard computer for the day. As it happens, it's actually my last trip before a much anticipated retirement. 1313th time I've been down here. The deepest part of the Ionian Basin. That's where the African tectonic plate slides beneath the Eurasian tectonic plate. The volcano, 230 kilometers away at Stromboli, is a direct result. A little creepy, isn't it? But don't worry, nothing can go wrong. Well, nothing apart from an earthquake, I suppose. It looks like we are trapped. And we only have enough oxygen to last another few hours. Luckily, though, I have a plan. It is a long shot, but it might just work. We need to break through the volcano. First, we need to head down there. I'll use a new shrinking software I've been tinkering with. And they said I was crazy. We're starting to burn water molecules and minerals to form a material called serpentine. And we need our base to be dragged down to 200 kilometers underground. Normally that would take several million years. I'm using new time-bending algorithm I've been pulling over. <laughs> and they said it couldn't be done. At these temperatures, the serpentine starts to break down, releasing the water and us to rise upwards through the overlying map. The temperature of the surrounding rock continues to rise until 1100 degrees Celsius the water dissolves in the melt to form buoyant blobs which rise quickly. Now we just need to break through this rock and into the plumbing system of the volcano. According to latest measurements, it might be just about to pop. <coughs> Here we go! on volcanology because I thought it might be a nice tie into some of Hugh's work but we've got a whole range of things from interstellar space from looking at the Large Hadron Collider and the Oxford Sparks team has worked really hard and those of you who are familiar with the science curriculum will see how many key words and how many ideas were linked into there that is something you can show in a school classroom and then use it as a springboard to bring into ideas whether you're thinking about teaching something about the rock cycle whether you want to students to go off and do something a bit more exploratory about how do we know what's going on how do we do these sorts of measurements and things like that and they're all accompanied by a set of teaching resources that teachers can take off the shelf and or adapt to their own students use for key stage 3 11 to 14 for GCSE pupils and for A-level pupils as well and this makes them accessible to teachers and to students. There are, there are links to the national curriculum, but there are also the chances to go a bit off-piste and to just really try and stimulate and to explore science within the curriculum, but also at the extremes. And 
I think it's really exciting what so many of our scientists are doing. We've got some beautiful examples here. And from the perspective of teaching, it is really about trying to just bring those conversations together and get them talking and get people working together. Thank you. Patricia. Perfect. Right, um, so today I'm going to be talking about um, cyanobacteria and extremes. Um, and uh, as I said, I'm an evolutionary biologist, um, understanding the tree of life of cyanobacteria. And cyanobacteria are probably the most important organisms that have evolved in our planet. Uh, and this is from our own sort of selfish perspective. Um, and that's because they were the first organisms to produce oxygen through a process known as oxygenic photosynthesis. And this is the sort of photosynthesis that most of us are familiarized with. And what they do is they, they fix carbon dioxide, uh, they use water as the electrode donor, they use light from the sun uh, as the source of energy, um, and they make carbohydrates. So they're major primary producers. But they also release oxygen, and it's this oxygen that has accumulated through geological time, and um, my research aims to understand how cyanobacteria might have contributed to nutrient cycles such as carbon, nitrogen, and also how this relates and how the, um, their history or their evolutionary history relates to these um, events that have been recorded in the geological record. Now, that has taken me to study uh, cyanobacteria from um, extreme environments such as oceans. Um, and oceans are extreme, or most of the oceans uh, could be um, sort of seen as extreme environments because they're known to be as oligotrophic. That means uh, very low in nutrients. Um, and in particular, nitrogen um, is an important uh, nutrient is a limiting nutrient. There is about 80% of nitrogen in the atmosphere, <coughs> but we cannot breathe uh, nitrogen. We need, we rely on microorganisms in order to fix or make this nitrogen bioavailable. And it turns out that cyanobacteria um, are very important um, nitrogen fixers in today's oceans. This is uh, for a figure of one showing the distribution of um, a nitrogen fixer. Um, and so my, some of my work have shown that nitrogen uh, marine planktonic cyanobacteria evolved around 700 million years ago. Uh, this is prior to the origin of animals. Um, and, um, and also, and it's around this time that we see that the oceans became fully oxygenated. This has be, you know, is being recorded in the fossil record. Um, Around this time, we also see that the Earth experienced some of the most extreme glaciation events, um, and that has taken me to study uh, cyanobacteria from extreme environments, such as the polar regions, um, and uh, around, this, around this sort of 700, 800 million years ago, uh, we see that um, there was a noble earth, and this is why I have a picture here. Um, and one of the things that we want to do in my lab is, um, we, at the moment, isolating cyanobacteria from the polar regions, and looking at the genomes, and trying to see if uh, these organisms uh, go back to this uh, time in history, and also to see if maybe, uh, thanks to these organisms, eukaryotes uh, survive through these extreme uh, t uh, times. <coughs> Now, um, going back to sort of the extreme and putting that into a geological con context, um, here I have a figure showing uh, the history of the Earth. Um, the, you know, with here the past, the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old, um, and we go all the way to the present here with humans evolving uh, to about sort of two million years ago. Um, but the Earth would have been, first of all, inhospitable. Life wouldn't have not been possible in the first uh, 600, 700 million years. Um, we have evidence that of cyanobacteria or oxygenic photosynthesis evolving and the, around this time. They are key 
2.7 billion, uh, but it really took over a million years before we see the evidence um, of animals in the geological record at around sort of 530 million years, which is sort of the Cambrian explosion. So for most of this time period, uh, if we would have arrived on Earth, we would have needed a spacesuit to walk around. Um, so those would have been very extreme conditions for organisms like ourselves. This is a brief um, sort of, um, I'll show you the um, sort of um, history of oxygen in this uh, diagram. Um, we have here the past uh, 2.5 billion years ago, this is present, um, and these are two major oxygenation events. And uh, here with this lime, uh, I'm representing um, oxygenic photosynthesis of cyanobacteria. So we have, they evolve around 2.7 billion. We have evidence of free available oxygen during the great oxygenation event at around 2.4, 2.3 billion. But oxygen levels at this time only increase very little, up to 0.1% of today's oxygen concentrations. And it's really until we get to um, the end of the Precambrian where the oceans became fully oxygenated. So what's going on with cyanobacteria and how the, it, that might be related? Turns out that uh, cyanobacteria evolve in freshwater environments. Very early on we have here some uh, multicellularity probably of this meaning sort of multi, um, filamental cyanobacteria um, up around the great oxygenation event. Um, Shortly after, we see that these organisms evolve traits that allow them to make microbial mats. Uh, you will see, probably familiarized with stromatolites, th these sort of things. They would have remained in terrestrial freshwater environments, maybe coastal environments, for most of this period uh, with a very little um, with concentrations of oxygen. And it's really until we get to the end of the Precambrian where we see these nitrogen fixers evolving in the oceans, they would, they would have been pioneer and they are currently um, some of, you know, extremely important in making this nitrogen available and sustaining uh, our sort of biomes in the oceans. Um, but um, it's really around this time uh, that we see um, a major revolution in the nitrogen carbon cycle and that represents the beginning of our modern Earth system. So that's the next. Okay, from the biology of the very small to the physics of the very large. My own personal research is to look at the various environments we found, find around our solar system. And we could come up with tens of different examples of extremes when we look out at, to the various environments within our solar system. If you just look at Venus, for example, the surface of Venus is baked to 500 degrees Celsius. It experiences pressures that you would only experience if you were swimming around for some reason at one kilometre depth beneath the Earth's oceans. And it is continually corroded by acid rain falling from the Venusian clouds. Look at somewhere like Mars, extreme cold conditions, but also subject to dust storms that can wrap themselves around the entire planet over a matter of months and completely change the climate conditions that are prevailing just there. Now, my per personal research looks at the giant planets themselves and the various diverse satellites that you can see around the giant planets. These are the Galilean moons in orbit around Jupiter, and we also have a series of satellites in order around Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and those of you with extremely keen eyesight might be able to see the Kuiper Belt objects out there in the bottom right of this screen that will soon be subject to our very first human exploration, or should I say robotic exploration, <coughs> sent by humans to explore the dwarf planet Pluto. So wherever we look, we find extreme conditions. And I always like showing this uh, figure. This is actually a, an image that's now 36 years old, would you believe, from the Voyager spacecraft that went out and visited the giant planets in the late 70s and the mid 1980s. Now this is a feature known as the Great Red Spot, an enormous circling hurricane that if you were to sit 
on a, on a, say, a weather balloon on the outskirts of this great red spot, it would take you about a week to go in an anti-clockwise direction around the periphery. And just to give you a sense of scale for the great red spot, our entire planet and everything we know and love would fit across these, this feature about three and a half times. So the scale of some of the objects that we find in our solar system is, can be considered as extreme. In addition to that, the intensity of processes that we find in our solar system can also be considered as an extreme. These are this particular storm feature in Saturn's atmosphere that erupted back in 2010 and I should say was spotted by an extremely talented amateur astronomer with a backyard telescope, albeit an extremely expensive backyard telescope I might add, and then proceeded to wrap itself around Saturn's northern hemisphere over the course of many months. We have an extremely sophisticated spacecraft called Cassini up there in orbit around Saturn right now that was able to capture some of these beautiful images of what was taking place. We believe that there was enormous eruptions of cloud material from deep within the heart of Saturn's interior <coughs> that lofted fresh white material high up into Saturn's atmosphere where the prevailing winds, the zonal jets, were then able to redistribute this material around the hemisphere. We could detect lightning strikes within the plumes that were rising up from Saturn's interior that were crackling away with energies some 10,000 times more powerful than any lightning that we see here on planet Earth. So again, extreme conditions. And that storm itself radiated energy high into the planet's upper atmosphere to create another vortex, another spinning hurricane-like structure that had temperatures that within the interior that were 100 degrees warmer than the surroundings. Just imagine a weather system here on Earth that was capable of changing temperature by 100 degrees. If this isn't considered extreme, I don't know what is. Now, I think if you try to encapsulate what planetary science is all about, it's about the search for the origins of life and what makes our planet special. And there are two objects, two bodies in our solar system that really capture that, capture the imagination of both public, the public and scientists alike. One is the small icy moon Europa in orbit around Jupiter that we believe has just the right combination of ingredients to make habitability likely or possible beneath this icy crust. We think that there's a crust about five to 10 kilometers thick that overlies an ocean some 100 kilometers in depth. That's more water than is contained within all of the Earth's oceans put together and potentially harboring the conditions for life to exist. Also, the, the satellite called Titan in orbit around Saturn. Now, temperatures there are so cold that liquid water can't exist. It's solid ice. However, you can still get standing lakes of liquid ethane and liquid methane on the surface of Titan, which means for the first time in the history of solar system exploration, we now know of a body in our solar system that has standing seas that one day we could envisage sending robotic spacecraft to sail upon those titanium seas, looking back across the mountainous landscapes and sniffing out the various chemicals and composition that might exist there. And finally, if we look beyond our own solar system to those planets that are now being discovered around other stars, some 2,000 new planets have been discovered over the last 20 years that represent extremes that we don't even find here in our solar system. From those planets extremely close to their parent stars that are baked to temperatures at thousands and thousands of degrees, hot enough to vaporise things like steel and ceramics so that those bizarre materials go on to form the cloud decks of these alien worlds. And I argue that the physics and chemistry that we find in our own solar system, places like Jupiter and Neptune, we're able to extend and simulate and model to try to understand what the environmental conditions are like on these extrasolar planets. And this last slide that I'd like to end on is a fabulous one from the Cassini spacecraft taken about 10 years ago now. From your perspective here, you're in the shadow of Saturn. You can see sunset on Saturn being refracted through the upper atmospheric layers just there. You can see the beautiful rings some 250,000 kilometres across being backlit by light being scattered uh, from the sun through those rings. But the most incredible thing about this image is that tiny speck of light seen there nestled within Saturn's rings. Now, that is nothing to do with Saturn itself. That is 
everything we know and love here on planet Earth, taken by a robotic spacecraft, nuclear powered, that we built here on planet Earth and is now a billion kilometers away in orbit around Saturn, looking at the Earth Moon system on a single pixel. I think planetary science is not just about exploring these distant, far flung locations, but really about teaching us about our own fragile climate here on planet Earth. So I think that's the, the last, last person to speak. Thank you. So to kick off the discussion amongst all of us, I'd love to come back to something that you were saying, Hugh, um, with your little prop <laughs> volcanic <laughs> dust you have there. <laughs> Is that OK to pass on the audience or Absolutely, should we yes. keep it safe? Yep. Is um, someone able to come up and then take, take <laughs> Hugh's little vial uh, of his sample that he's got here? So can you talk, as we're passing okay. on the audience, can you talk through what you can actually see in there? I mean, how big is it? How grit is it? If, if we were to take... The, thank you, sir. If we were to take the top off that and kind of yes. dip your finger in and poke it, would it, would it be gritty? Or These, is it kind of yeah. soft and, and rounded? These are little gritty bits, which are... It's ob obsidian, which is volcanic glass. This is the youngest obsidian on the whole planet. So it is pure volcanic glass that was blasted out in explosions, like very small explosions when the water in the, in, the, in the borehole was hitting magma that was there. And so that's why it's been broken up into little pieces. People have spent weeks picking with uh, tweezers and, wa and washing the mud, because there's lots of drilling mud when you have a borehole. They've been washing the mud out to try to get these little grains of obsidian. And we've got a international team who's going to be trying to work out what, and what was going on inside that magma. It's got frozen in chemical clues that we can try to interpret to work out what, how long that magma had been there and what exactly it was doing. So please don't lose that sample. <laughs> <laughs> I, I noticed that he was keeping a very close eye as it we, weeds its way back and would, forth. Would this allow us to uh, determine whether we can fly planes through ash clouds any better? The volcanic glass was one of the reasons that we were grounded, wasn't it? Um, that's ago. some of the work that we're doing. So uh, people, especially in Munich, they're setting up e experiments with engines and they're blasting ash through it. It's the process of sintering, which is when you're welding particles w when you heat them up. So these angular fragments of ash become melted and, and they'll stick onto surfaces. Right. So that's very, uh, that's very much being looked at at, at the moment in what volcanology. What sort of temperature do you need to melt this stuff? This came out at about 900, something like that, okay. degrees okay. C. So how close did the, the, the tip of the, of the drill that was boring this hole it hit the, uh, the, the, the obsidian ash there and kind of mm -hmm. like that blasted back out? Was it within kind of metres, tens of metres of, of, the, of the liquid rock itself, of, of the magma? We want to work this out. <laughs> this is fascinating for us. This is the first time that anyone has ever actually drilled into magma in a volcano. We didn't think there was going to be magma there. And all the techniques that we've got to try to see magma which is, for example, you don't expect uh, to see earthquakes where magma is because it's a fluid, essentially. So there were earthquakes in this area. Um, so all the techniques that we've got to, to try to deduce that magma is underground were saying no. So we've got to try to work out why yeah, exactly that was the case. <laughs> was it a tiny pod of magma, say that the volume of this room, or was it a huge, great volume? We don't know this. Um, after it was drilled, people hastily um, filled the borehole with concrete, <coughs> as you, you may think that's a good idea. Um, we've now got a plan to try to get some, uh, some funds to drill back down into that same borehole to try to intercept it once again yeah. and find out how much is there. So, Hugh, clearly you're going, you've got your boots on the ground, you're going to these volcanoes, you're, some might say fairly foolishly, poking your finger to the side of the volcano <laughs> to expose the magma. You're kind of seeing things in situ up close. Mm. But I guess, Lee, that's kind of impossible for you. You're talking about remote worlds and, and the outer gas planets, so... Well, I'd love to be able to try. Things, you, you take a, a flight out to the outer solar system, you, you go on a, on a mission I, I think given the time scales involved right now, I mean, to get to somewhere like Jupiter can take five to ten years doing a gravitational slingshot around the sun. And it'd be system. very hard to bring yourself back again after Yeah, I think years. I'd miss a lot of fun <laughs> stuff if I was away at that great distance. So, I mean, most of the tools we use are both ground-based observatories here on planet Earth and spacecraft that we send uh, out to these far-flung distant places. But, of course, it costs an awful lot of money to do those sort of, sorts of missions, and you only really get one opportunity to do sure. things right, which is, I mean, people often ask why it takes so long for, from the germ of an idea to fly to somewhere like Saturn or Uranus or Neptune or wherever, why it takes so long to actually develop a mission and get there. It's because you really have to 
dot all the I's, cross all the T's, because as a scientific community, <laughs> you're not going to be given two chances to go ahead and do this sort of I mean, we say these things are expensive, but they're kind of only hundreds of millions of, of euro or a billion or two euro, which is, it's a lot of noughts, and, and I'd it love is. to have two billion euro myself. So it's, it's big in my context and in mm. our context, but in terms of aircraft carriers or even just kind of fighter jets, it's... It's small change. Absolutely, it's and I think that the thing that people tend to forget as well is that we're not actually putting billions of euros in a suitcase and blasting it's it into coming space. Coming back to your salary, isn't it's it? Well, not, <laughs> sadly, not just me. But it's, but uh, it's money it's that's really it's around in, the economy. It's investing in science and engineering. It's investing exactly in the economy, making sure that we are world leaders here in the UK in doing this particular type of science. And we do, I mean, there were publications that came out uh, just a few weeks ago that showed how UK... For, for the amount that we invest in science right now is actually hitting well above its weight in terms of what we are capable of doing. And to give you, I mean, we, I was talking about the Europa mission that uh, the, the United States are about to launch or they're about to start planning for a launch <laughs> of a mission to Europa, hopefully in the next decade or so. Here in the UK, we are part of that mission and we are going to be lending our scientific expertise. So you're helping to choose the instruments, that the bits We're, of experiments that will be launched. And we are part of things like the, uh, the, the, the various payload elements that will be doing science, albeit in the 2020s and 2030s, so long time to wait for it to happen. But right now, today, we're helping defining the requirements for how that science should be done in the next, uh, next few years. And that's part of the story that isn't, doesn't always come across when scientists are talking to, to children in school about how possible it is for their careers to be involved in this. And it might be as one of the scientists mm. doing the research. But there's such a huge backroom of people doing really important support work and technical work as well. There's a massive range for, for careers within a massive range of different scientific roles, which is fascinating. Mm. Which is something I guess you talk about when you're doing your own public outreach, isn't it? There's, yeah. there's not one kind of scientist, but they're not all dead old. No. <laughs> well, I think as well, it, it, when you study science, whether it be at GCSE, A-level, or if you go on to do a degree, it, gets, it gives you a toolkit, really, mm. a top problem-solving toolkit that not everybody can go on to carry on working in rocket science or studying the planets. But, but it, it, that doesn't necessarily matter because the mathematical techniques, the problem-solving techniques will always be with you and allow you to hopefully apply, apply them to big problems here on planet Earth, such as climate change, which I know you touched on when you were talking about the, the effects of uh, volcanoes on the climate system. I mean, it's something that's very important for us to be able to model the... Uh, how do you cool an atmosphere down, I think, is something that's going to be a big question for us. Over With next. geoengineering being considered as a possible intervention this century, it's definitely very relevant to look at extreme systems. Yeah, quite. And, and in, a, in another sense, it was volcanoes that saved us from this snowball Earth, wasn't it? That the, the Earth had frozen over, it became very white and reflective and shiny, so it was kind of locked into a cold state. But it was volcanoes that rescued the Earth by, by building up a greenhouse effect. <laughs> Yeah, um, well, and with respect to the Snowball Earth, um, there is quite a lot of stuff going, you know, a lot of theories about Snowball Earth. Um, I mean, my understanding of that is um, there are lots of feedbacks uh, in the Earth system that we still don't understand. Um, I mean, one of the things, for instance, that I, one of the things that I've done um, is, well, there is quite a lot of geochemical evidence for, say, the oxygenation event for the snowball um, itself. So can, um, we, can we unpack that a little bit? I mean, you showed this wonderful graph of the <laughs> oxygen concentration of Earth's atmosphere going back billions and billions of years. Yeah. Clearly, we're not measuring that directly. So what, what kind of proxies are we using? How can we mm. estimate what the oxygen concentration would have been? That comes from geochemical evidence. Mm. For instance, the, the full oxygenation of the oceans comes from things like molybdenum. Um, molybdenum is... Um, um, Micronutrient uh, is essential uh, for life, um, but is only um, soluble in oxygenated waters. So what we see around <coughs> this time um, is that molybdenum record goes crazy, okay. um, and that means you know the oceans were fully oxygenated, which did not happen before during that period that I showed when oxygen concentrations were very low. So that is giving us clues, plus several other sort of proxies, um, geochemical proxies. So, but what hasn't really happened is sort of marrying the two geochemistry and evolutionary biology. Um, most of the um, evidence that comes from the oxygenation events comes from sort of geochemists. Mm. Um, but 
very little has been done from the sort of biology perspective. Um, and this is one of the things that I like to do with my research. Mm. Um, and sort of, because these are extremely complex um, processes. Um, so um, one of the things that I've been trying to do is sort of not only uh, produce the evidence from the biology, but learning quite a lot of geochemistry to try and understand and the how the yeah. two uh, join together. And a lot of that thing will require uh, sort of collaborations with other people uh, because these are sort of problems that go beyond. Because it, there is geochemistry involved. Uh, we also, you know, I also work with climate change scientists um, because the, you know, for the synthesis, as these, for instance, cyanobacteria started colonizing the oceans, um, that happened just before the snowball earth. And I think there is a link between the two. Um, and I need to work with climate change scientists to try and model this and see how uh, this might have happened. So you're saying that there might be a link from cyanobacteria colonizing the oceans, yeah. having a new <coughs> niche, growing very rapidly. Yeah presumably sucking carbon dioxide out of exactly. the atmosphere as they grow and make organics out of it. Exactly. And then triggering a global... A snowball earth. Which, which in, in a sense, was, was deleterious. It was a bad thing for, for their own. They, 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 I mean, it wasn't... They made things very difficult for themselves. It made, the it made things own. very difficult. We have, you know, there are sort of three major glaciation events, but they become less severe. Um, but something that is happening at this time uh, with the oceans fully oxygenated we also see that um, eukaryotes so which are um, organisms that have a nucleus um, things like uh, green algae started colonizing marine environments we also sort of see the origin of animals so the way in which carbon was cycled completely changed and that's probably why we did never see a snowball earth ever happening again um, but this is all very new stuff mm. that um, will require um, sort of the collaboration with climate change scientists to sort of T show, demonstrate, <laughs> demonstrate that this is happening. So, but it's really, really exciting. And you mentioned the, the Canberra explosion, which isn't a bomb, it's a biological it's a event. Can, can you just tell us a bit more about that and, and what might have been the trigger for the Canberra explosion from the, this kind of geochemistry and then the story of the Earth? As it yes. From molecular clock records, um, we, we see the Cranberry explosion, that means sort of a lot of uh, sort of fossils or animal fossils appearing at around that time, and they seem to have appeared all at once. But this is something that kind of started happening um, at around 750 million years. At that point, we see an immense diversity of fossils appearing, um, and uh, what was very exciting when I was doing the work that I should, you know, um, that photo of nitrogen fixers mm. is it seems that nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria evolve before that. It's almost like they went into the oceans, they fertilized the oceans, they not only help increase primary productivity, uh, which then led into the oxygenation of the earth, but they would have served as organic uh, as organ carbon as food source. Um, and so they were involved in <coughs> fixing nitrogen, more carbon and oxygen. We've got a lot to thank cyanobacteria for. We have a lot to thank cyanobacteria. <laughs> and it's really the combination of all these events, um, plus lots of other things were happening. The continents were starting to split up. Uh, so it's not obviously just about cyanobacteria, but the several other events that happen around the time. Sure. And it's really that sort of unravel like sort of a massive sort of diversity and evolution happen. It's almost like, you know, biology interacting with the earth, the earth interacting with biology, and there we go, you know, we have our sort of modern earth system, which then I guess makes uh, at that point sort of planet is not such an extreme place. Yeah. Um, so th this, this accumulation of oxygen over time, um, create the conditions for, for more advanced life forms. Exactly, and explosions. exactly. So it's really Lee, that. Can we, can we read that kind of thing in, a, in a, an exoplanet's atmosphere? Yeah, potentially. We can't use molybdenum because we can't go to this exoplanet. No. So do we have other ways of seeing the, the composition, that what, what the air is made of, I guess? So potentially we can. We're in a very early stage, I would say. We're trying to take um, a spectrum of an extrasolar planet. What we'd like to be able to do is measure the distribution of energy uh, in a whole different range of wavelengths 
and detect whether there are signatures like oxygen, mm. like ozone, which is then a, a chemical um, uh, reactant that's produced from molecular oxygen being present, and to try and detect whether they're there in significant quantities within an extrasolar planetary atmosphere. Now that, I would say, is probably a few decades away in terms of capability right now. Uh, what we are doing with extrasolar planets today... Well, what's the today, main constraint there? Well, what's the, the choke point in it being a couple of decades rather than... We know the principles, we know the, the yeah. theory to how to do it. What's stopping us We So it what we are doing when we look at an extrasolar planet is we're not actually directing resol directly resolving the planet itself. What we tend to do is we're seeing the decrease in the starlight as the planet passes in front of its parent star, or similarly, if the planet's going back behind again, there'll be another slight dip, and the process is called the transit mm -hmm. technique. <coughs> so by measuring that transit in lots of different wavelengths, we can build up a spectrum. Now the problem is, is that the stars themselves are very active. There are things like star spots and filaments and uh, various different explosions that can happen on the surface of stars, which can change the way you'd measure the spectrum. And the contrasts that we're trying to detect of a small planet in going in front of a big star are so tiny that it's pushing technology to the absolute limits right now. I mean, we do have a range of discoveries out there, things like uh, methane, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and water. We know that water, um, so it's interesting to hear you talk about the complexity of, sort of the Earth and the biology system, because as a planetary scientist, we're probably decades behind that in terms of we use very broad brush strokes when we're talking about habitability and what we call the Goldilocks zone or the habitable zone, something that's just the right sort of temperature for liquid water to exist. And we then say, well, liquid water is an excellent solvent for the reactions of the biochemistry to actually occur in. But of course, it's a very Earth-centric perspective and we don't really have a universal definition for mm -hmm. what what life is what yeah. life is is like we're assuming carbon nitrogen yeah. fixing I mean, and, and the thing is like it took if you look at the diagram where i show the history of the earth it, these are processes that took billions of years yes. <laughs> to happen so it's just um and um you know we're still trying to understand how you like there, there are those two oxygenation events and mm -hmm. Um, is what happened exactly at that time. You know, that's, that's what being puzzling scientists for quite a long time. And I think I mean, if, we, if we do find oxygen as a signature in an extrasolar planet, or ozone, the, that's the other one, and there are various other chemicals that we describe as biosignatures or bioindicators, then it would be a fabulous discovery. Now, that's not to say it's an um, entirely 100% certain discovery. I think one of the things about studying our own solar system is that we could potentially envisage one day going there with a robotic spacecraft and detecting life. I mean, we're not there yet, but if we could, I think that would be one of the most important discoveries we ever make. Because if life spontaneously uh, came into existence on two very different extreme uh, bodies, then suddenly we have the possibility that throughout our universe life could be commonplace if it happened twice yeah. for different reasons within yeah. our And in terms of habit habitability, you were saying something very, very interesting over tin biscuits before we <laughs> stepped on stage uh, about exactly what you found on the flank of a volcano with, with the methane seeping out and what that meant. Absolutely. So this is a volcano in Iceland called Katla that people are worried about and it's ice covered. The ice is very thick, it's about 600 metres thick that makes it quite difficult to monitor the volcano. We're trying to pick up earthquakes, but we're not sure if it's the ice moving or if it's the rocks breaking, and that's quite critical to know which. So one of the things that we're doing is going to a glacier there, which is famous for having a very smelly river. <laughs> it's, I don't know whether anyone's been to this place in Iceland called Solemjökull, which is a river that smells of rotten eggs. And we've, we very much wondered why that was the case. And we've been, we've been measuring the, the composition of the meltwater coming out of this river. It's absolutely full of methane. It's pretty much fizzy water coming out, which we were shocked by. And we straight away thought, well, this must be um, volcanic gases, because methane is one of the gases that comes out of volcanoes. It's mostly water and CO2, but methane's in there as well. And my colleagues in Lancaster ran some isotopic uh, analyses to try to work out whether the methane was um, coming from the magma or not. I uh, know it looks like it's biogenic methane. But so how can you tell that? I mean, methane is methane, or I presume um, it's not, so that you well, can tell the difference. You've got the isotopes of carbon and hydrogen, and when you stick those together, there are special kind of combinations that are like a barcode. And this means that you can then work out whether it's coming out of magma from high temperature 
or if microbes have been making it. And it's firmly looking like it's microbially produced, which is fascinating. because There was it, quite a lot of methane to skin during the early Earth. And it's during, after the great oxygenation event, a lot of that uh, methane um, sort of went down. And in fact, they, after that great oxygenation event, mm. the first one, um, we see a snowball Earth. There are signs, and that's probably because oxygen um, appeared and that trigger that, snow, that snowball Earth thanks to less methane. Mm. Um, so that probably, mm. what it probably meant is that it pushed into much smaller habitats, those methanogen regions. Mm. It's kind of refuges. Exactly, which we still have. It's probably like yeah. the, the organisms yeah. that you're finding, you know. So th Absolutely. those things probably would have evolved very early on, is that, but what happened is as cyanobacteria made the, the environment more oxygenated, it would have pushed things into much smaller niches. And, and it's particularly important for Mars as well, I guess. And yeah. before we open up to questions from the audience, um, and while I have team biscuits on my mind, because uh, Judah said something very, very interesting over, over a cup of tea as well, um, which is when you're, you're trying to connect, you're trying to engage with students in the classroom, when you're talking about a, a new way of doing that, something which is not particularly traditional, something that might be surprising, which is using kind of games and, and playing yeah. to, to get people... I guess not just interested in the first place, but when you're playing a game, you're kind of analysing a problem in a particular way, and I'd, I'd love to how one <laughs> does that. <laughs> There's all sorts of different levels at which you can use games in the classroom. I mean, the word obsidian has become part of the everyday language of school children because they play Minecraft, for example. And learn not to and they dig, into the magma. And they <laughs> dig into the lava and get dye and everything else. <laughs> so there's that sort of everyday <coughs> level and the familiarity of playing games like Angry Birds and just thinking about trajectories and the amount of physics calculations that have gone behind that is really fascinating and engaging to that. But there are also games which, as well, going through them and the choices that people have to make through them are also bound up in science and in logic as well. But the, the biggest sort of challenge is, is trying to make very abstract co concepts concrete. And you were saying earlier on about how, you know, as science gets bigger and bigger and broader and broader, we learn a lot more and more. It's all very abstract. You know, we're talking about interstellar space. Actually, most of the stuff we teach in school is pretty abstract. You try <laughs> explaining the difference to, between current and voltage to an average 11-year-old without using analogies and metaphors, and you won't manage it. Mm -hmm. Okay, It's very abstract. And that's the beauty of the science that we have. We have these analogies and models to explain the world around us. And it's about trying to bring those into as many different situations and contexts as possible to build up people's understanding so that they don't just learn about something in one particular idea, but learn about it in multiple different situations. Mm. Do, do the extremes help? I mean, when we're talking about extremes that are sort of wow moments for us as scientists, do they yes. translate into the classroom or do they make it harder to explain? They the do in, in, in lots of different ways, not just because of the wow thing, because it also helps people you can start then tracking back this big wow idea to to where they're at now in their own school studies and just thinking about there's a link between them and you're using ideas that are being taught by teachers at different levels but they're still being same used by teachers yeah. it's still the same concepts and that's what's so lovely about science is that it is it builds and it's very very interconnected and I guess you can even create, recreate the kind of eureka, aha moment that a scientist will have when, when you know, every now and then, when they're, they're going through the research. <laughs> you can recreate that in the classroom with, with this puzzle. Once you've kind of solved that yes. puzzle, you kind of, your brain, however it does, it kind of puts the pieces together and you finally see the solution. It's going, oh, yeah. And Absolutely. then you can't see how you never, never yes. didn't get it. And that's, yes, which is lovely. And that's sort of joy about being able to when teachers have freedom to do some more of those things and to do more investigative work rather than recipe following, which is not always what you want practical work to be. So how, how do you ensure that this remains in, you know, in the syllabuses and, and in the minds of, of, of ministers to not just have education of learn these facts, learn these figures, label this diagram. I despised A-level biology, <laughs> but went on to a degree and then PhD in it. And, yes. and how do we use that kind of, that, that challenge solving to... You, you, you probably need a top-down and a bottom-up approach. I think there's a massive amount going on at grassroots with, with teachers bringing in their friends from <coughs> science background to talk to the kids in the classroom and people like yourselves going into schools and just having that enthusiasm going on. And then there's the policy making and the, the need to have those discussions that the Royal Society has with other people like the Institute of Physics, Institute of Biology, Royal Society of Chemistry, are constantly trying to have those inputs into ministers and regularly, 
every time they redraft the curriculum, they send it out for consultation. And they do, there's a large number of us within the t education community who do our best to get in something that isn't just 19th century physics is it, is it hard, into the curriculum. Is it, is it hard convincing politicians that maybe playing Angry Birds in physics A-level is, is not it just something to do on the last lesson of the term? I don't want to get into politics. <laughs> it depends on the politician you're talking to. So, I mean, talk me through <laughs> what, what you would do with Angry Bird. You, you would you'd play the game and you'd freeze the frame and then draw a parabola yes, and work out the Yes, you can do all sorts of things and you get, yes, you can do those sorts of things. You can do really nice analysis. If you do slow motion um, car chases of a film, you get students to time it and measure, then work out the distance and then you can draw speed time graphs. It's much better than doing ticker tapes. Or, or I guess find out where, I don't know, for for speed when they mm. jumped the bus over the impossible yes. crevasse the, the, the bridge you, you could show where the, the physics is not being obeyed yes and i guess if you don't tell the students that beforehand they'll stretch their heads for a little absolutely. bit absolutely you can do all of those that's things and just mean. go into all the sort of calculations that they must have done to get to them yeah brilliant stuff cool. um we've got about 35 minutes left so i think now is the perfect time to open up to the floor uh to questions from the audience we have roving microphones i believe we've got one or two one on each side. Um, so we'll take a question from this side. There's a gentleman with a blue shirt. And if we can queue up the second microphone, um, the question, sorry, there's a, a hand right at the back that caught my eye first. And then just to be an asked to you, we'll take a question right from the front after that one. Um, <laughs> you, sir. Yes, this is a question, I think, from Dr. Barry Caldo. Oh, yeah. uh, I was in Zurich a couple of uh, years ago in the summer, and the Lake of Zurich, it was one solid green suit of Cynobacter. Uh, you could see it from, uh, you could see it on Google Earth, uh, and you could also see it in the pictures of Zurich um, published by the tourist office. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a massive, massive bloom. Uh, we've even had it in the, in the ponds in, in London. Can this it be used? This is our freshwater <laughs> lake, yeah? That's right, yeah. yes. Can it, can, it be, can it be used? It's obviously highly prolific. Use uh, what? Um, can, can you eat, eat cyanobacteria? Can you? Um, <laughs> I, can we use it for cooling? Or can, we, can, you, can you make oil out of it? I mean, um, I, Some <laughs> people are trying to, uh, you know, people are use it, you know, for um, sort of, I think in, in California they have some farms uh, and trying to sort of uh, f fix huge amounts of carbon dioxide to offset, um, you know, all the um, carbon that we're throwing into the atmosphere. Um, I also believe you can use it to eat, you know, I think they, they, they're farms. But for the people at um, the back of the room that can't see Patricia's facial expressions here, <laughs> <laughs> I, I suspect she's not a no, fan of eating no, 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 I, I, I would be, you know, I, I would, I wouldn't mind, um, but um, yeah, no, I mean, cyanobacteria are extremely useful, and, and a lot of people are doing um, sort of biotech with that. Uh, people use it to. Some are, some are very toxic, in fact, um, and uh, there is quite a lot of money that can go into research to try and prevent um, those blooms of cyanobacteria, especially in, in freshwater lakes. So, yes, they do have psychotoxins, they're called. Um, but not all of them have them. Um, so, but there is a huge diversity of cyanobacteria. <coughs> so you will find, I think they're most diverse in freshwater environments. Um, in marine environments, they're not so diverse. Um, we're really down to about four groups of open ocean uh, planktonic cyanobacteria. But yes, there is a huge diversity of them. Um, and you'll find them in all sorts of habitats from the polar regions, deserts, um, terrestrial environments. Excellent. Uh, our second question was from right at the back, on the right-hand side. Yeah, a uh, question for uh, Dr. Fletcher. I'm interested to, um, I mean, it's, it's kind of like the inverse of the subject of the event, uh, detecting planets that aren't extreme. So I'm interested to, um, to know what hope you think there is for using kind of near-term science to detect um, advanced civilizations on other planets. Can we look, for, ex for example, polluting gases using transit spectroscopy or my personal field is in detecting geoengineering on exoplanets and I'm just interested to know your views on that. Yeah, I, I think exoplanets is such a, a young field that we shouldn't put anything off the table 
uh, to begin with. I've, I saw a paper not uh, very many days ago that was about detecting the, the increase of uh, emission that you would expect if on the night side of an extrasolar planet a city full of sodium lights was coming into view. Would you be able to detect that as a signature? And, and the issue is technological again. It's beating down the noise levels on those sorts of transit measurements that we can take right now. But there are advanced concepts out there for spacecraft that would have extremely large... Um, there's a technique called interferometry, whereby you can have free-flying spacecraft that are all communicating with one another that would increase our <coughs> ability to resolve a planet separated from its parent star much, much more than we can do it uh, today from, say, 8-metre or 10-metre class observatories. You could do things that were 100-metre Like the scale. very long baseline array, yeah? Exactly, yeah. And so now we're pushing to a regime where it's not these transit spectra we're measuring anymore, but actually directly detecting the photons from those, from those planets. And if we see absorption signatures from polluting gases, I mean, the, the, in Earth observing, we've been measuring things like CFCs for years as a result of the, the aerosol usage in the 60s, 70s and 80s. I mean, that is something that's a signature of the presence of a, an advanced, albeit not necessarily that intelligent <laughs> civilization, pumping <laughs> gases into, into our atmosphere. Um, you know, we, I don't think that anything is off the table uh, right now. But there, are, there is the smoking gun for the um, establishment of intelligent civilizations elsewhere would be the detections of signals from, from their television, their radio, their communications uh, satellites. And things like the SETI project out in the Arecibo Observatory has been looking for signatures of such, uh, such emissions for, for many, many years now. Nothing yet, it seems like a quite lonely universe uh, from that perspective, but uh, it's, it's worth the effort to keep trying because I think it would be a fundamentally uh, a, a discovery of such ground-shaking proportions to, mm. to detect something. Judith, you like talked about, about the Drake equation, didn't you? Yes, in terms well, of it's, teaching. it's one, again, it's one of those fundamental questions that comes up, why is the sky blue, why do we have rainbows, is there life elsewhere in the universe? And it's always wonderful when the science teachers have the skill to b talk about the Goldilocks planets and to talk about the Drake equation and stuff. And, I, you know, physics graduates are usually very, very confident at doing that. And it's part of... The, the, you know, part of my job as somebody who trains science teachers is to work with them so that they can have a go at answering those questions and introduce students as well to that idea of doing a back of the envelope calculation. So we, you know, we've been looking at exoplanets for this many years, this is how many we've found, this is how many we think might be this sort of size, and then sort of working through that is, is, is part of what science should be about as well. Well, one of the interesting things about the Drake equation is one of the terms at the very end, mm. which says, well, how long would an advanced intelligent civilization hang around for, especially when we're doing big uncontrolled experiments like uh, climate change without hopefully geoengineering coming to the rescue and things like snowball earth going mm. over a, a tipping point in our climate system that could lead to a to an environment that from a a, a human life centric position yeah. suddenly becomes so extreme that we can no longer condition uh, continue and, that, and then that last you have term to is throw in the whole thing that students really struggle with <coughs> is how far away those things are and how long the light has been traveling just to get here mm. and that blows their minds every mm. time <laughs> Um, so we had a question for the second microphone to come up to the front row here, please. And on the left-hand side, do we have a question? Yeah. And can the right-hand microphone come to the lady sat in the front here? Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, sorry, sorry, we'll come to you second. So I'm queuing up questions so we're not waiting for the, <laughs> the microphone to go. Yes. Um, I was tickled by a a certain irony that arose earlier on that might actually end up being a very interesting uh, discussion point. So Lee's been talking about how thick the ice is on Europa, was it? Mm -hmm. And how deep the sea is. And then on Titan, you've got uh, you know, the frozen surface and the liquid puddles of methane, this sort of thing. And it just made me wonder, um, Hugh, should you not maybe be asking Lee next time before you go and dig a hole and potentially <laughs> blow up a car park? <laughs> There's definitely a lot of parallels in, the, in these different planetary systems. I think that we need actually much more feedback in conversations like this one. This is fascinating. 
Well, and we, we're learning so much from the, the, the Earth system, people who are exploring these extreme environments on Earth. I'd say that um, there's always the rule that planetary scientists are about 20 years behind the Earth scientists and exoplanetary scientists are 20 years behind the planetary scientists. There's, we're all learning from one another, and it's actually events like this where we all do talk to one another about the synergies between our research that I think are very yeah. valuable. One of the great things about the, the Royal Society that we would normally meet in a conference, would we? But we would meet here at uh, a discussion <laughs> meeting. So. Whether it's an irony or not, I'm not too sure. <laughs> It just reminds me of that situation where you know people say you know more about the is it the workings of the human brain than the bottom of the oceans, mm -hmm. and actually that seems like a very tangible example of that. Yeah. 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 Right, it's one for Dr. Pat Patricia. Okay. I can't say your surname. Yeah, um, these early photosynthesizers need pigments to trap the light energy, <coughs> and I'm sure I read somewhere that the pigments evolved in response to a sort of defense against ultraviolet light. Is there any truth in that? I don't know where I read it. Um, there are different types of pigments. There are the pigments that um, are involved in photosynthesis, but you're right. There are other types of pigments um, uh, that are at the, found at the surface, and in fact, that was uh, so, sort of sunscreen, if you like, because UV would have been stronger back then, especially before the ozone layer. Uh, so you find um, that quite a lot of these cyanobacteria that have this pigment um, uh, are, you know, it, that probably evolved as a response um, and as a sort of their own natural sort of sunscreen. But yeah, no, but there are different types of pigments. One for photosynthesis, one for protection for UV. So, yeah. So they're not the same one? No. no. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yep, so we can get a, uh, the right hand microphone to halfway down here, and then we can come up to this gentleman here first, please. Thank you. <coughs> yeah. Uh, Hugh, you talked about the um, communities who are at risk from. <laughs> Uh, volcanoes, but we saw a month ago that in Nepal they're at risk from earthquakes. Is there any um, is there any link between the um, the earthquakes and the volcanoes in terms of predicting? Um, I presume there are people like you who are trying to predict, do the same work that you do with respect to earthquakes. But do do they have any common features in terms of when when they erupt or or shake or you know, are there are there other differences that that uh, come to the to, to light? Right. I mean, that's a very interesting question, and I guess you should add that the places where you tend to have volcanoes te uh, often corresponds with where you have very large earthquakes. For example, Chile, or, or all around the Ring of Fire, is characterised by very large earthquakes as well as eruptions. So it's the question of what happens before an earthquake and what happens bef uh, before a volcano is going to erupt. Um, actually trying to forecast an earthquake is exceptionally difficult. I'd say it's more difficult than forecasting a volcanic eruption because we are starting to identify for volcanoes, for example, patterns of, of precursory small earthquakes that might be accelerating towards the failure of a volcano, which is a crack forming, and then the magma coming out. We're struggling with understanding what the thresholds are, but there is a basic um, ability to forecast from that method or from tracing gas emissions, etc. In the terms of um, forecasting earthquakes, I mean, that, that's very difficult to find out what the precursory signals are. You could have deformation of the ground, and you could have some idea about the state of the stress, so that how much stress needs to be uh, dropped in, in a certain locality, uh, so to speak, whether an earthquake were overdue due to the stress being high there. Um, there could potentially be some gas emissions uh, prior to earthquakes, and this is a very interesting new field. But the, you, can, you can also get interactions between earthquakes and volcanoes. And one of the volcanoes that I do most, most of my work on at the moment is called Coroncauye in Chile. And its last three <coughs> times that it has um, gone off has been shortly after major magnitude eight eight earthquakes in the vicinity. So we're trying to understand why that is the case. Um, somehow this magma is, uh, that is being stored underground seems to be shaken 
and somehow this shaking process is then later triggering the eruption. So one could consider whether it's simply bubbles that are forming in the magma, similar to shaking a bottle of carbonated drink. But it could be other things too. It could be that the, the actual stress uh, in the rocks, in the, the volcano has been affected by the earthquake. So that rock movement actually could open up fractures in a whole volcanic area. That's exactly the kind of thing that we want to try and work out, because if you've had a major earthquake, it might mean that you've then got to be much more careful in all the neighbouring uh, volcanoes. And there's lots of statistics that's currently being done to look at the interrelations between the two phenomena. Hugh, how can you be so sure of the sequence of causality there? You're saying the, <laughs> the yeah. earthquake is shaking up the magma chamber and causing a volcano. Could it not be mm. swelling of the volcano that's somehow releasing stress in the fault? Or um, could, could it be either? Are you pretty sure it's one way? When you've got local volcanoes, then, uh, sorry, when you've got small earthquakes that are in the volcanoes themselves, you can be very sure that it is the local stresses. But we're talking about um, earthquakes, say the Valdivia earthquake in Chile was, say, 300 kilometres from the volcano. And we think that is very much out width of the influence of the volcano. Okay. We had uh, another question halfway up here. Yeah. <clears throat> Your presentations were so stimulating, I'm prompted to ask, are there any other examples of extremes in science? <laughs> can, can anyone think of uh, any other extreme? Interstellar chemistry. Yeah, the astrochemistry Astro is very interesting. Is really that getting into meteorites and comets. Absolutely, and you're working at looking at temperatures really close to zero and looking at how the elements behave there and the atoms and the is fascinating. There's a video about it on the website. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know a massive amount of it, but it is really interesting and it is fascinating. Also going back to the physics of the the very first moments of our universe, back to the, the era of the Big Bang. I mean, there's mm. a, the concept of inflation that would have happened in the first well, fractions of a second when the universe uh, first formed that caused rapid expansion and seemed to have taken what may have been quantum fluctuations in the original state and imprinted them somehow on the rest of the universe. And it was those fluctuations that then allowed stars and galaxies to form and evolve to the architecture that we see today. But it, it, it's such short timescales and such high energies that even our physics may not be capable of truly characterizing and appreciating what went on. There's a limit to our understanding with quantum theory about how um, what, what the conditions were like that prevailed at that time. And I'd, actually, I can't think of a better example of extremes than at the origins of the universe. Uh, in my own research, I, I focus on things which are, um, by definition, extreme, like extremophiles, the hardiest life forms on Earth, and how they survive in places like the Atacama Desert in Chile, which is the driest place on Earth, and also <coughs> the most Mars-like place on Earth. So I study how, how the life can survive there, how we can detect signs of it, which kind of links into the, the mm. biochemistry. And then when we send our probes to Mars, how we could have a good chance of finding potential Martian life there. And I think what all of us have been, been saying on stage is it's learning a little bit something in this field and then applying those lessons or those methodologies elsewhere. Um, and, and science is becoming increasingly interdisciplinary and mm. kind of mergy and smeary <laughs> uh, with each other. Smeary. Um, are there any children in the crowd which, which have, a, have a question? You always have the best questions. Grown-ups are boring. <laughs> yeah. um, no? No pressure. I mean, don't feel, <laughs> don't, don't feel obliged, but if you've got a question, I'd love to hear it. Uh, I was wondering about the uh, Santorini eruption. You're wondering about what aspect of it? Uh, uh, the, um, as to why it was so yeah. extreme as an eruption? Uh, well, this is a very interesting eruption. Um, it's thought that there was a huge volume of magma that had accumulated under the island um, in an in a underground chamber, say at a depth of about eight kilometers. And it stagnated there. It stayed there for a long time. And then suddenly there was a deeper magma is thought to have come up and agitated it because it was hotter magma. And this just heated up this kind of cauldron of, undergr of underground magma which then uh, the pressure went up and it burst the rocks around it and you had a very rapid rise of a uh, huge volume of magma, so much that the heart of the island was blown out and you're left with this spectacular ring called a caldera. But this, <coughs> this had a massive impact locally, didn't it? Because it, it, this wiped out many communities in the area. It's an incredibly important eruption. Have you been keeping an eye on your little vial of, of volcanic ash as well? 
Who, who, who has it? Yeah. Thank you. It's still, it's still safe. Uh, any other questions? Yep, yeah, we'll, we'll come up to the front on the left and at the back on the right. Thanks. And I apologise, this is going to be a very boring adult question. Right after that. <laughs> Interesting. Adults are boring. Um, how do you fund science and how should we fund it? And you're all saying it's an expensive business. The, the observation, I, mean, I don't quite know how it all works, but broadly it's very, it seems to be very nationalistic taxpayers' money that funds And is that the right model, given that there's all these amazing extreme issues that are global and even beyond global? And how do we move to a sort of more global funding and should companies fund it or should it be individuals or should it be governments? And anybody got thoughts on that? I think um, individual companies, especially within the UK, you tend to find a shrinkage of research and development um, aspects of a particular business, simply because some of the things that are being required can be outsourced more efficiently than they can be done in-house, um, which is sad in a way, because it, it limits the capability for, say, you're a big company, you employ lots and lots of engineers, to allow those engineers to pursue pet projects and pet ideas on company dime, effectively, to do it that way. You're quite right, I think all of us, are you, we're taxpayers' money, yeah. isn't it, to, to, fund our, to fund our science. But as a percentage of GDP, UK still is paying a low amount compared to other European countries um, uh, that, that we know and of, Germany being... A great um, deal of the scientific research is done in a very international way. If you mm. think, I mean, CERN's the obvious example, but there's a large number of other large-scale facilities a lot, there's a lot in astronomy. I mean, just down the road from Oxford where I work, there's Diamond and, and the ISIS lab. And they are, they are European-wide in terms of their funding, and they're in global in terms of the user base of the community that come there. So I think perhaps we haven't perhaps truly reflected the international nature of the collaborations in which most scientists mm. are engaged. If, if, if that interests you and in, in the funding of science in the UK and its importance to the economy, uh, look up... Uh, a group, an organisation called Science is Vital, um, which is a kind of mm. grassroots um, uh, organisation trying to kind of apply pressure on the government to, to underline just how important science is for, for driving the economy. Um, do, do all have a look at that. Um, we had a second question at the back here, yeah. Uh, I'm guessing it's slightly similar to what we've just been discussing there. Um, a lot of people would be, uh, their experience of science is going to be from what they see on television, what they hear on the news. But as well, we get a lot from Hollywood. So I'm just wondering, um, how much do you guys roll your eyes when you watch popular movies? <laughs> you know, we've got San Andreas coming out at the moment. Um, we've had other films recently. Um, how much time do you spend um, decrying <laughs> what Hollywood does? Again, it's a favourite te teaching technique is to take a Hollywood movie and get your kids to critique the science and go, no, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. So if they can do that, then actually they might have learned something. Mm. But yeah, I don't know how you guys feel about... I think uh, with Hollywood and uh, from my background, science fiction in particular, I mean, it, that's what got me excited about doing science in the first place. It was when I was a teenager that I started to realise that some of the stuff I was enjoying in science fiction, actually the science fact was just as exciting and hey, mm. I might have a future yeah. in actually working on that. So I, I come, not necessarily Hollywood, but certainly television is what influenced me to get in mm. uh, to the field in the first place. So, and now I can look back and, as you say, critique all the things that were wrong with that. <laughs> Come full circle. Yeah. yeah. Definitely, um, in earth science departments, people may have a cinema night where we could sit together and watch The Core or something like this and think about the plausibility of some of the ideas there. If only you had that dematerialisation theme to get into the yeah. uh, Further questions? Any from the audience. Uh, we'll take one from the front on the right here and front from the left. Sorry. And we'll take them on from the, the front, sorry, on the left first. The microphone's already there. Yeah, I, I guess I've got a question about extreme teaching. I was very struck <laughs> by the fact that it took so long for the decimal numbering system to cash on. I think it was a matter of centuries because people found it very difficult to understand. And yet now it's taught to primary schools, taught in primary schools. Could you envision a time when maybe quantum physics is taught to 13-year-olds? I mean, is the ability to understand a factor of teaching or a factor of intelligence, or both? Uh, 
it's in a way we were talking about this earlier on as well and it's a, that big question isn't it but as we discover new ideas and as as our understanding of science increases is at what stage do we introduce it to the school curriculum and how far down does it go one of my phd students is looking at how quite complex ideas about evolution have been brought into the primary curriculum and about how teachers are trying to work with that to make sure that they understand it well enough to teach it properly at that level that the students can access. And I think with, we, as with all teaching, it's about sort of bringing where, what do the students know and how far can you bring them up. But then there's always that big question about people in universities and lecturers and professors spend a long time banging on about how students don't know the basic facts well enough and the teachers are going we've done our best to teach them that but the people who go on to do science at university a very small fragment of the population and there's that sort of tension between trying to give the people who will stop studying science at 16 a bit of a taster and a bit of an understanding of lots of science so they can continue to enjoy it in popular culture and in news etc for the rest of their lives and yet prepare those people who are going to go and do A levels and degrees and PhDs, etc, etc. And that's something that the education community has been grappling with but very much over the last 10, 15 years. And the curriculum has swung one way and the other. And I don't we haven't settled down yet. So there are, you can teach some very complex <coughs> ideas to young kids, but not when you've got Ofsted breathing down your neck. <laughs> yeah. Um, the next question was, was here, yeah. Um, with regards to volga volcanoes and trying to extract energy for, for our use from magma, uh, is it feasible to use water or would you have to use a much higher density fluid to start and slowly graduate down till you get hot water or steam? Because I imagine if you put water down, it would be just completely explosive. Um, it, that's the kind of question that we're looking into right at the moment with um, the international group that are coming together to try to understand the processes that take place in these unprecedentedly high temperatures. But um, uh, one, one would expect that if you have a high pressure uh, water uh, that, is, that is in the uh, borehole, that you could have some flashing of explosions where you would suddenly be flashing to uh, steam. And exactly the physics of the process that, that's going to be taking place, I'm not sure, but I wouldn't want to send any other uh, liquid down there. I think I'd be quite happy with having water <laughs> as a cooling agent and as an extractor of, of heat because it's got such a high specific heat capacity. It's an excellent uh, conduit for thermal energy. So it, 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 that would be a very definitely the best thing to use. No lower density magma. <laughs> um, not for now, <laughs> but potentially in the future. <laughs> uh, we have time for one final pair of questions. I think there was a, a hand in the middle here that I've been consistently ignoring. Um, and we'll take a second question from up here. Sorry, did you come past it? That's it, yeah. Thank you. Um, my question... Um, in terms of looking for extraterrestrial life, are we not limiting ourselves by looking for the same proxies that make life possible on Earth? We're looking for water, we're looking for signals of whether they watch TV or not. I mean, is it not possible that to find a kind of an extreme life that are so different from ours that they do things completely differently? And if we don't remove that um, restriction in trying to find life that look exactly like us and do the same things like us that we might it, it makes it very difficult to find something else that might be very extreme yeah the, the the difficulty in astrobiology is the very thing you're trying to find is by definition alien to you different to you but you can look at the the, the laws of physics and the biochemistry um that we've elucidated and understood as all of you, as we've already heard a lot of the organic molecules that terrestrial life is, is, is built from, the kind of Lego bricks that, that our cells are made from, uh, a lot of that organic chemistry is formed in outer space, kind of amino acids and mm. the, the nucleotide bases that make up DNA. So there's good reason to expect that alien life would be built in the same basic chemistry that we are. And I guess even more importantly than that, we know that our way of life works. It's, Hi, we're here. So let's look for the kind of stuff that we know works and we can have a good shot at recognising because we look for it in places like the Atacama Desert and other extreme places on Earth, and then apply those techniques to places like Mars. And if we find nothing on Mars looking for our kind of life, then maybe we'll try something 
different. But I think with, with limited budgets, as, as Lee's been saying, as Lee's been saying as well, let's let's make things easy for ourselves mm. uh, before but, moving on. But, but you're quite right. We should not ignore the possibility that we're being too terrestrial <coughs> focused in our in the way we're looking at things, um, especially with this Goldilocks idea of the temperature range being just right for life to exist. But think of it as a starting point. It's a starting point based on what we understand today, and there are very good reasons why water should be the solvent that allows the biochemistry to occur. It's the, the way the hydrogen bonds are formed and the polarity of the molecule itself. So starting point, but not the end of the story. And of course, we are always open to ideas for new life and new civilizations. Mm. And Europa's right. outside the, the habitable zone. Completely anyway, outside. Very different model. Yeah. Um, one yeah. final question. Does someone have something they've been burning to ask? Yes, sir. If we could pass the, the microphone for you. There we go. Thank you. <coughs> my, my question also relate with extreme teaching, and, and you mentioned about role of teacher. But uh, there is also a lot of work on self-organized learning environment for children. And uh, given the technology like uh, visualization technology, virtual reality, 3D sort of stuff. Now, uh, uh, is it time to kind of, you mentioned about two techniques, one is in investigative, other is recipe-based mm. learning. So don't you think it is time now to shift to investigative learning kind of predominantly and uh, not uh, rely on teacher that much? So it's, it's a good question. It's one I regularly ask my undergraduates. Um, why do we need teachers every at all? And they're, they're physics undergraduates. They're not on their route to becoming a teacher. And they always come back to actually, yes, in there's many ways that we do, because teachers, a good teaching is not about telling. It's about listening and about discussing. And as yet, we don't have artificial intelligence that does that. And so that's what it is about. Good teaching is about, li yeah, it's about listening to the ideas, listening very, very carefully to the vocabulary that students are using, because that's when you piss up, pick up the misconceptions. And it's about working with that, because let's face it, students are pretty good at figuring out what the answer should be on an assessment or on a multiple choice questionnaire. We're all quite good at those sorts of things. But actually pinning somebody down and saying, right, in your own words, tell me what's going on in this simple electrical circuit. That's when you start to figure out, yeah, you've got this bit, but you don't have that bit. And for that, you need a person. And you need enough of them who know their subject well enough. Um, <coughs> excellent, which brings us very nicely uh, to the top of the hour and, and our end, end of our time. Uh, thank you ever so much for all of you for coming along and please join me one last time thanking Hugh, Judith, Tricia and me. Thank you.